Hello, welcome to the June 17th, 2022 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, my name is Greg Undo, and I'll be the host for the live stream. And I will go ahead and make sure my audio is coming through okay on my monitoring computer. Then we'll begin. All right, so my name is Greg. As I mentioned, my name is Greg Undo. I'm the host. I'm presenting from uh, Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. area. Um, for those of us who have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you ask questions either by sending an email in advance to clubcubase at steinberg.de, or you could just simply uh, ask your question in the live chat field when asking questions. If you could indicate which version of Cubase that you are running, and also if you could, like, whether it's you know version 10, 10.5, 11, or 12, if it's LEAI, Elements Artist, or Pro, and in addition to that, which operating system, that would be uh, useful information. So, um, and <clears throat> I can't necessarily. <clears throat> excuse me, keep up with all the questions in real time. So if you have a question and you've typed it in the chat field, uh, at that point, you um, if we could refrain, from, you know, you don't get an immediate response. If we could refrain from, you know, typing the same question over and over again, that would be appreciated. So we'll try to get to them all in chronological order. Um, so we will go ahead with that. Um, and we should have all of the topics indexed tonight and pinned to the top of the comments field. So if you wanted to rewatch the video after, uh, we should be able, you should be able to do that and kind of see which topics with timestamps. And if you wanted to search for topics that have been covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com and Jan from Stockholm has been kind enough to compile uh, it's, I think it's over 18,000 questions or so at this point since the pandemic started that we've covered on live stream. So you could search there. So we want to give a special thanks to Jan for his efforts. Uh, we have two people that serve as moderators. We have Agent K and Jazz Dude. They're not Steinberg employees, but they uh, just work as um, they work as volunteers to make it a better community. So we want to give a special thanks to their help uh, to make it a better uh, forum for everyone. And also, if you want to look for another wonderful resource of complimentary Steinberg information, you could check out uh, the Cubase Nation Discord, and Jazdu does a lot of work with that. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started with questions. I think there's maybe a couple questions I saw earlier that got knocked off. Um, and I think one of them was... Uh, the first question was like how to copy uh, a range of events that have been selected with the range tool. So, and if I missed your question, sometimes uh, when we start some of the questions that were submitted like hours before get kind of kicked off or lost. So my apologies. So if, if you had a question to submit it earlier, uh, please feel free to ask it again. Um, so let's say if I wanted to just duplicate a particular range of events like this, once I have it selected with the range tool, you could just hold down control or command plus D, and then you could duplicate that particular range just like that. And if you want to undo, we can just undo the particular range. Okay, so we just see... Um, Hello, Greg from Canada. So is there a, a question? Is there a way to quickly switch between four plugins so that when I select one, the other three are deactivated? So I assume that this will be on inserts. Um, so if we come here to a particular audio track and we will come, let's say, and we'll load up a couple of different plugins, like maybe we're auditioning different compressors. So I don't think that there's kind of a, a straightforward way because generally you don't solo um, different plugins, but we'll see if we can maybe do it with uh, maybe doing track presets. So if you wanted to do this, Okay, so let's say we have our plugins loaded here. So I guess we want to 
select one and disable the other plugins. Um, you know, it, so if it's with sends, um, so I don't think that there is, if we go to our project logical editor, a way to specify, um, you know, particular like multiple like plugin slots. So let me just take a look though, just to see if I'm missing something. We'll just say container type is a track and but I don't think that there is a way to All right, so let's say if I have um, all of these, we'll see, I don't think this will work, but we'll give it a shot. Uh, so if we go to um, okay, and we will set this to toggle and remove this. And we'll make this on selected track. Yeah, so there isn't a way. So what you might have to do is, you know, if you wanted to do it, you could say, I want it to have like on this particular track, we could save track presets, and this may not be the fastest way, um, and then be able to, so let's say if I want it to come and save a track preset, and now if we wanted to do, you know, one that was track preset two, so we'll come here, Okay, so when I come to Media Bay and let's go to our user presets, to track presets, to audio. Um, if I wanted to drag over insert one to the track, it doesn't save the status. So I don't think that there is a way to automatically, let me just, so if I come here, you know, and I have nothing turned on and let's say I drag this over to the track. I could do that and let's say if I wanted to drag this preset over. So you could save it as track presets, but it's probably, you know, longer than to just simply kind of turn this all on and off. You could send it to four different tracks and then, you know, solo kind of the routing here to the four different tracks uh, if you wanted to, but that's probably not super fast. Um, so generally it's not, you know, a typical thing in automation, but if you're like auditioning different effects, I could understand kind of the workflow for that, but not a super convenient way of soloing an insert effect. So sorry about that. Right. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, in audio editor, event start and event end doesn't show up even after checking the show events uh, name in event editor. Uh, do you think I have to install Cubase again or delete preferences? So let's say if I'm on a particular track and I double click and uh, so, so we're in the sample. Uh, I 
Okay, so I'm not sure if it's in the sample editor and it's for uh, Razel. So, you know, if it's going to be like, I don't see like the event editor and handles like that, you know, maybe it was uh, turned into a part. So if you don't see like the handles, if it's an audio event, you know, check to see if it's like, you know, if it was switched to part, and then if we wanted to go to audio, we could say dissolve part, and then your handles, and often kind of names may carry over. If it's in the sample editor, um, you know, you, where I would think that it might show, so say, um, you know, there's the... So it, if it's we don't see the events name here, so we could check. Um, so I'm not sure if it's so we can see like the event start and end here. Let's see if we go to our settings, if there's kind of like a different name field. But let me know if it's in the uh, on the project window or within the sample editor that you're seeing, so. Okay, so I just see from Tata Digital Studio, please, Mr. Question, please, Mr. Greg, I want to know how to add base and Cubase elements. Um, so how to uh, add base. So I'm not sure if you wanted to open up a base part to play, I see there's like a little emoji of a speaker. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to add an instrument track, we could come over here. And if you go to Halion Sonic SE, if you want, I'm sorry if I'm misunderstanding question here, uh, but if we just go to the Halion Sonic SE, let's get this loaded up, sorry about that. And, you know, there's a number of different bass parts. So if you want it to, you know, just come over here uh, and drag that, you can now um, play the particular event uh, and be able to see that. And let me just check my audio connections quickly so we can hear. So now, as soon as we come here, uh, if you wanted to add bass frequencies to a particular track, you know, what you could do is as we come over, we could just uh, do EQing. So let's say if I wanted to go to my master output and add more bass, uh, we could come over here and say, while we're playing, you know, I could take the low end frequencies and just add more bass. But if you could let me know uh, what how to at bass means, if you could clarify, that would be helpful. Sorry about if I'm misunderstanding. All right, so we see a question from Jay from Connecticut. Hi, I'm heavily considering M1 Ultra. However, VSL VE Pro doesn't have M1 native support. Uh, I'm wondering about emulating Ensemble Pro template through VST system link. Uh, is it possible? Please demo. Um, so I, I, I don't have a second computer and my audio interface doesn't have a digital connection. So I, I don't really have the ability to show a VST system link. I could show it in maybe, uh, in a, in a live stream next week. Uh, but, um, you know, how it's going to work is, you know, with VST system link, you know, the concept is it's almost like we can send, uh, we can sample accurately synchronize between two computers, or we could send MIDI data over a digital audio connection. So uh, to do 
you know, it would require two different computers, each having a digital audio, like a common digital audio connection, SPDIF, you know, TOSLink, uh, AES, EBU, et cetera. So, and then that would kind of handle all the clocking. So it's, you know, system link on one single computer doesn't, you know, doesn't really work that way. You know, you can think of it as like synchronizing two 24 track tape machines, similar to, uh, you know, like, you know, having two computers synchronized to have more power that way. All right. So we see filter freak checking in from a nice glorious hot summer day in the South of UK. We see that there's a conflict of interest tonight with the Spectralator 9 premiere in three hours' time. So, yeah. Yeah, we should probably do better with making sure we don't have multiple live streams going on at the same time. Okay. All right, so we see Jazz Dude on. We have Brian Sawyer from Crystal Coast, North Carolina. Thanks for joining us. All right, we have Uno Memento checking in from Finland. All right, we have VTX Rudy checking in from Chicago. All right, we see Jan from Stockholm. All right, we see Nick from his sweltering Essex in the UK. All right, so we have a question. Um, all right, so, so my chat field just jumped on me. Okay, uh, so we have a question from Benny. He says, uh, Greg, can you explain a bit about how VST Live works? Yeah, so this is just released this week from Steinberg. And we could think of this as being more of a, you know, kind of a, you know, concert production tool. So when we come over here, we could just say, okay, we want to do um, a new project. So I'll just say, let's open other project so the concept is and i still kind of learning this myself is as we work on it um we can have a set list and this set list is you know we can think of this as like a typical set list that would have songs so we could add various songs to the particular project. So if we come over here, we can say, okay, in our set list for live performance, we want to add a new song. This song is called uh, Welcome to Here, whatever your title. Uh, within this, we could now add parts and these parts could be different instruments. So we could say, okay, I want it to have Maybe uh, like during the verse, I wanted to have like strings layered with piano and I wanted to be able to set different split points for velocity and ranges. But let's say in a chorus, I want it to be an organ sound. So instead of having to send program changes, we could just set with a MIDI controller or using the up down arrows. We could do this and now we could play our different material, and then we could also just switch to different songs. So we could have, if you're a gigging uh, musician and you have backing tracks or you want to play with virtual instruments, and these aren't limited to just VST instruments, you could have these go to different MIDI outputs. So if you have a performance keyboard that you wanted to use in conjunction with virtual instruments, we could do that. Now we could also create stacks, and stacks are... We could think of these as being like, okay, I want it to have my guitar part or my vocalist run through different VST effects. And the, the included VST effects are, you know, with, you know, no or minimal latency so that we could have like your different guitar parts. Now, what makes this a bit different is now we could actually have different tracks. In Cubase, now, once this has been installed, we could export a media project. It's not going to include the automation 
and different components, but we could take your Cubase projects and come over here and play. And we could have this in the timeline. It's not intended to be a MIDI sequencer or a DAW, but you could do all of your work that you've done in Cubase, migrate it here, and we will have our different tracks. So at this point, we could say at measure 3.1, we're gonna trigger a, an action to go from our verse keyboard sounds to the core to the chorus sounds and i want to switch guitar amps at that same particular time we could have up to six different video streams that also go out and once we work with this um so we have our video streams we have display so if you have the pro version you could have different lyric tracks so if you wanted to come to, you know, different, uh, you know, have the lyrics like a teleprompter appear on an iPad or your iPhone, you're going to be able to do that and to be able to see the chords. Uh, once we also get into this more, we're going to have the ability of doing DMX lighting support. So as we kind of start to add different types of tracks, you know, we could say, okay, I want it to have a, a a audio tracks i wanted backing tracks and loops and i wanted to come over here and let's create a dmx track to do lighting and i wanted to have my lyric track so that i could have the words just you know synchronize like a teleprompter in time so instead of having multiple kind of disparate systems that aren't connected we could just take your vst instruments and have your kind of entire live show for switching instrument sounds from, uh, you know, keyboards, virtual instruments seamlessly to have everything kind of organized. And when you go to your set list here, you can say, okay, let's go to our set list. And I want to take these songs and, you know, I want to change the order tonight. Everything's going to be kind of loaded with everything in a set. Uh, completely configured for you so you could just kind of change and have access and play back to tracks you know with backing tracks without backing tracks or to come over and you know build your stacks of different audio effects or different virtual instrument layers and be able to kind of have everything done with a synchronized timeline with multiple video tracks controlling the lighting so obviously, as you know, productions uh, have gotten very expensive to do, you can now have a very high level production and have this all done from this particular software and be able to take your Cubase project as the basis for this and load it in. So that's a quick overview on some of the VST Live. And we'll get more into it in, in, in the upcoming weeks and maybe we'll do kind of a specialized uh, live stream on it but it's a quick overview all right i think it's exciting software all right so we see uh robbie bowling from dallas and we have uh chris from jersey in uk we see John Costigan from Kenosha, Wisconsin. We see Michael Pierce from London. Right, we have Stefan from Sweden. All right, so we see, uh, hi Greg, I was trying to mix a song in Dolby Atmos, and when I try to export it, it crashes instantly every time. Is this a known issue? I'm using a 2019 uh, Mac i9, thanks. Um, I don't think so, but let's come over here, um, and let me just see if we do a, a quick uh, Dolby Atmos export. Um, so let me just... Come over, I may have a quick 48K prod version of this project. OK, 
Okay, so when we come over to, let's do our ADM authoring for Atmos. And let me make sure my audio interface is set to the right buffer size. Okay, it is. So we're set to 512 and let's get to our setup assistant. Okay, and I will just go ahead and do some horrible panning here. Okay, and so let's go ahead and try to export our EDM mix. And let's just make sure we're gonna be doing binaural. So when we come here and let's do our export. So we would do it from the ADM authoring for Dolby Atmos. So it looks like it exported and I have a, you know, my Mac is an i9 as well. So make sure that you're not exporting it through the typical export audio mix down, but that you're exporting it from the export ADM file. And that's what would include all the metadata for all the Dolby Atmos panning and uh, different mix down formats. So let me know if you have that set up, Matt. All right, so we have uh, Steve from Kenya asking his question is, uh, is there a way of making a draft track? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by draft track, but let's say if you, you know, recorded different ideas uh, and, you know, if you at this point said, I didn't like that, you could go to like a new version and then record over top of that. So even if we wanted to come here, we could say, Let's duplicate this version, and I want to, at this point, do different edits. So I, so maybe this would be what you consider a draft. So I want to do this, and oh, I hated every single edit I did. I want to go back to where I was. So just kind of using track versions may just kind of uh, do if you're looking for like a draft track, but if I'm misunderstanding, uh, let me know. All right, we see the amazing Kerwin Young on the live stream from Atlanta. Thanks for joining us. And John Costigan, I'm not sure if I, if I, if I recognized him earlier from Kenosha. Always oh, great to have John on. Okay, so um, okay, so we have a question uh, from Rob from Tarpon Springs, Florida. Uh, is there a way to delete all the bar numbers with one step from the score? Uh, so let's go ahead and let me just. Open up this project and we'll take a look. Okay, so let's say we have our measure numbers here. So I think that if we come over here, let's go to our, our staff settings. Let's go, I think it's just going to be in, I think 
be notation styles. So Okay, so if I wanted to go to, and you could just double click here or go to the scores to settings. So try going to notation style to bar numbers. And then you could just have it off where there's no bar numbers whatsoever. Or you could say, I wanted bar numbers uh, on the first, uh, the first, you know, bar line here. So you could do it directly there. So once again, go to scores to settings and then go to project to notation style. And then you could scroll down to bar numbers and then you could just deactivate bar numbers there or there, there are your different settings. So give that a shot, Rob. All right, so we have a question. Uh, is there a way to create a super minimal workspace window for project window without side and lower bars, minimal menu options, uh, basically only the working space of the project window? Yeah, so we could do that. So really, if you just wanna see only the project window, if we go to the upper left right-hand corner, we could hide the inspectors you could hide the lower zone and hide the right zone. So we could just see only the particular contents here of the project window. So if you wanted to add those back, it's just one mouse click to get each of those back. And then you could even set that up, um, you know, with different keyboard shortcuts if you wanted to. But this way you could deactivate the different zones Okay, so I think Razel is just asking about the uh, event start uh, in the lower zone, about the in the sample editor from his earlier question. So you know, one thing that you could do is if you know to navigate, if you want to do this, you know, if you just grab, you know, like in this little preview window above. So, you know, you could navigate here, or if you wanted to select to see less data. So maybe if it was, if, if you open it up here, and so say I only want to see like this amount of data, and then if you want to move and navigate that way, so maybe that would help. But if you still think it's maybe just kind of like a graphics anomaly, you, you may want to try just out of curiosity to, you know, so as we would just kind of add your different lanes, we could navigate within the sample editor here. So let me know if that's helpful. But you could always, if you still think it's misbehaving, you could try to restart Cubase by holding down uh, command option shift or alt control shift. Um, so command option shift on Mac, op, alt control shift on Windows, and try starting without preferences and see if that brings it back for you. All right, we see Gareth on the live stream. So, and he's indicating it's 40 degrees Celsius there in Spain. All right, in Bilbao, I believe. All right, so we have Jeff Zabelski checking in from Chico, California. Glad you both could make it to the live stream today. All right, and we have Lewis checking in from Chicago. All right, John Costigan is reminding everyone to hit the like button. So, and that's how we can continue to do this. So if you haven't necessarily, uh, you know, subscribe to the channel, make sure you do that and hit the like button and that allows us to continue to do these live streams.
All right, so we have a, a Q uh, from Jay, um, and this, I think a continuation of the system link question from earlier. Okay, uh, so it says, if second computer was M1 with purpose of processing uh, the virtual instruments and effects for the VST system link connection, what might an effective environment group templating system look like? So a lot of people will, you know, for if you're doing on a second computer is, you know, it's really, you know, often people, you know, in the old days, we had something called VStack, and that was intended to work in conjunction with, and it was really kind of the precursor of VST Live, but VStack was intended to uh, host virtual instruments. Um, but most of the days what people do now is even get a copy of Cubase Elements and use that because Cubase Elements can work with VST System Link and they could just host their instruments on the other computer and do your and do the VST system link there and use that as kind of like a you know an instrument farm per se. Uh, a lot of people also use VST system link to run video. So many composers will run their video uh, on one computer and then VST system link that so that it's not taking any processing power away and it's sample accurate for synchronization. Um, so just an effective instrument group would be, you know, once you have the instruments loaded, they would be able to be accessed. Uh, when you go to an instrument track, you get your outputs and you would see uh, up to 16 MIDI ports with 16 MIDI channels that could be sent over via VST system link. So a lot of in the older days when VST system link was introduced, there's, you know, most audio interfaces had digital connections and, you know, they're not as common today. So just be aware of that. All right, we see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. All right. All right, so we have a question one, uh, how to record. So if you're recording audio, we want to make sure that first uh, we have your audio interface configured in your studio setup and we go to our um, audio system and we would want to select the driver for your particular audio interface. Uh, and then we want to make sure that we go to your audio connections, click on the inputs tab. And at this point we would say, okay, on stereo input one, we're using these connections. If we want to add an audio track, at this point, we could right click or click on the plus symbol here in the track list and say we want to add an audio track and I want it to be a mono or stereo track and we could just say I wanted to use my stereo in one, which I defined my inputs for and then click on add track and we want to make sure that we click record enable here so that when we hit record that this track will start to record when we hit record. Now, if we wanted to monitor and hear the track as we're recording, we could click on the monitor button. So we will come over here. So if I hit record now, we've now recorded a track and it's always good to name so if you come over here, just give the track a name, and then as you record, that will be the name of the audio file, will match the name of the track. Now if we wanted to record MIDI, all we have to do is we can add a MIDI track or virtual instrument track. So if we add an instrument track, so let's say we've added an instrument, and in this case, I've added a piano. So if I wanted to, again, we make sure that we have this track record enabled. And we set make sure that we have the correct MIDI input. So usually by Cubase by default, we'll do all MIDI inputs. And now as I record, I could just come over here, hit the record button and And everything that I just did was recorded directly into the system. So, and if you don't have auto quantize on, it would help. So, 
but that's how you could do kind of how to start doing a recording of MIDI or of audio and or MIDI. Okay, so I think we covered the next question, how to record voice. All right. See, Michael Pierce is saying, Voodoo Leche, it's in everyone's live set. It is. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's hot on the cover band circuit. So, at least here in the States. So, it's going, it's going viral. All right. My chat field just jumped on me. Sorry, let me just go back to where I was. Let's see, Hete Lap says, uh, I have to listen back to the live cast because I'm actually too busy in the studio with uh, and with Flow Cubase 12, and my gear is just perfect, thanks to Greg and the helpful ins helpful instructions. So glad to help. Glad that you're able to use your Cubase. All right. Okay, we have a question from Ed Rugman. Great to see you on the live stream. Um, so the question is, hey, Greg, uh, do you think it might be possible to slip a track backward to a negative bar value uh, before the project start time, uh, non-linear editor video software allows us uh, a couple times. I've thought it handy. All right, so let's say if I just come here, um, you can see like in my case, I have a project zero bar. Um, so, you know, we could just say, if you go to your project menu to project setup. So we'll come over here to project setup. So we have this concept of display bar offset. So if I set this to zero, all right, everything, I, my whole project starts at one, but if I wanted to slip something before that particular time, we could do a display bar offset. So let's say I'll give it two measures. All right, and now everything will start, you know, at we have a measure, instead of starting at measure one, we have a measure zero, a measure negative one. So if we wanted to move, you know, elements, you know, back earlier than that. And if we look at this, we could say, let's add a ruler track. So when we add a ruler track, we could choose this to be in the time format of seconds. We could see that, you know, we could have you know, our second start there, um, or so, you know, there's a number of ways of doing different offsets, but if you wanted to have negative time, just come over to your project setup and that's just accessed by hitting shift plus S and then you'll see in the display bar offset, you could just adjust it there. So let me know if that would work for you, Ed. All right, we see Michael Teams has already started with the virtual ice cream, so it's great. It's a hot day for a lot of people. All right, so we see uh, from Ed Rugman says, excited uh, by the teaser for VST Live Pro, Greg. Are you going to do be doing anything with that at all? So, you know, this may have been asked before we did a quick run through of it, but we'll be doing more of it in the future. So, yeah, it is excited. through comments. Let's see, it seems like it's hot everywhere. All right, so we see the new hot mess release, the standard version of Prometheus will be released July 22nd for those people who are following. 
is different than the special seamless version. So that's good. Now I know the difference myself. All right. All right. Great to see Randy Lee on the live stream from Texas. Okay, so we just see, uh, is there any way to create a logical preset for track height? I uh, couldn't find anything. Maybe I missed something. So I don't think that the track height is kind of set automatic. You know, there, there's settings in the project logical editor for that. Um, and I'm just seeing if, I think I may have looked on a previous live stream. I'll take another look in preferences to see if I'm missing uh, like a default setting. For track height. So we have the smallest for showing names and data. Default track name width. But I don't think the height this is going to be, I think, more color-based under the uh, color schemes. So here is going to be, yeah, I could do some more searching on it, uh, but I don't think that there is a way to set, uh, I don't think in the project logical editor for kind of a default track height. So sorry about that. All right, so we have Panos checking in from Greece. Thanks for joining us today. And we have Brianna from Youngstown. All right, and Matt Elston from checking in from UK. All right, so uh, we see from Ed Rugman, uh, do you think it might be possible to request Mackie control as a selectable output in the new control surface mapper? Um, this would solve my transport shuttle issue. I'm having um, I'm having a shuttle wheel. So I, I could request it, but you know, some of the Mackie control stuff could be uh, pretty limited, so I'm not sure if you have a you know an actual Mackie unit, or so sometimes different units may not implement the shuttle the same way. Um, but you know, but you know, it's kind of when you're utilizing you know to go one, you know, to get varying levels. So, but you know, I know that sometimes you could do the shuttle stuff you know but often a lot of controllers don't kind of have different levels so but i'll i'll pass it along as a feature request all right we see jeff sabelski is in number 21 like smasher today so that's good All right, we have Pablo Gordes checking in from Chicago. Tim Weinheimer from Mission Viejo. Thanks for joining us. Glad you can make it. All right, we have Ivan from Portugal. Michael Teens is on the ice cream distribution today. And I've been granted one gallon of coconut cream pie ice cream for my family and myself. Thank you. All right, and we have is it Jarvin from the Philippines. Yeah, my chat just jumped on me. OK, 
Okay, so I'll just take a look. Um, and just open up project and just for Razel's question. So let me see if we could jump back to that. Let me open up this project. Okay, um, so just see from Razel, it says an audio editor lower zone event start and event end doesn't show up even after checking into preferences, show events name and event editor. Okay, I'm just gonna see if it's the preference here. So let me just see if it's the preference here. Um, sorry if I'm being danced on dense on this. Uh, Okay, so just reading it. Uh, in the audio editor lowers an event start and event end doesn't show up even after checking it. Okay, so I think it's when we see this. So let me see if it's if it is um so if you come here so i maybe this is it razel sorry for, for being dense uh but if you show clips and events i'm not sure if you see that or show events or if it's just when you have show if it's set to show clips maybe that's it so i'm not sure if that's what the preference you're referring to to see that uh, and check your zoom. So maybe you could make sure that it's set to auto zoom for events. Because if it's like this, you may have, you know, it could be just maybe out of the range, but set auto zoom to events. And then just to that, it's today, you know, you'll make sure that the events are shown as opposed to just clips. So let's say if we now, Come here, we could see the event names. So if, if those are the names that you're talking about, sorry for it's my misunderstanding. Okay, so uh, we have a question. Um, with VST system link, as I've never sent MIDI remotely, what are the overall maximal number of MIDI VST channels I could remotely trigger? So I think it's 16 ports of 16 MIDI channels. So I guess you could do 256 MIDI channels. I haven't done it in a while. 
just because my computers are fast enough. Um, but I think it's 16, uh, you know, 16 uh, ports with 16 channels. So. All right, so we see a question from Michael Pierce. Uh, any thoughts on a new plugin format from Bitwig slash Yuhi? Uh, perhaps more of a Zoom question. Uh, just wondered what the industry thought. So, you know, it, it's always interesting to see new technologies come out, um, but it didn't really seem like a huge uh, benefit to uh, over current VST from what I saw. So, but I, I didn't, you know, I'm not a software developer, but, you know, may have a hard time, you know, you could probably ask, you know, even Microsoft kind of their, you know, DirectX plugins and, you know, their other plugin formats to replace that have never taken off, you know, MAS from Motu just kind of, you know, never took off. So I'm not sure if there's a, a need for another plugin format, you know, that just, but we'll see how it how it goes. But it didn't seem like a lot of you know hosting companies that were that you know that were on board with it already. So. Okay, so we had a request from Gareth to uh, for me to show Michael Teens how to export MIDI options, uh, in particular export as MIDI zero. I still get confused. Um, so you know, if you have different MIDI tracks, you know, it's always um, you know really helpful. You know, if you if you're trans, you know, if you're you know sharing a particular project with someone. Um, you could just simply export, you know, come over here and export MIDI file, and that will take all of the MIDI information in this particular track. So we'll call it Teams. Uh, and then we get our different options. Um, so you could, you know, probably you want to, you know, leave the default settings here. So you could just say export as type zero, um, leave that unchecked. You know, ironically, there's two different types of MIDI files. There's a type zero and a type one. So type zero MIDI files all come in one track. So, you know, it'd be nice if it was the other way around, be easier to remember. Uh, and are really intended to kind of for hardware sequencers. Think Roland MC505, uh, Lesis, uh, you know, data, you know, the little MMT8, the, you know, sequencers of that era. Uh, but, and so you can probably just leave these default settings and just export your MIDI. But I think both of you guys are running Cubase. So maybe if you just sent the project to Gareth, that he could then go into import uh, tracks from project uh, without having to do anything. So if you just upload the project to him, and at this point we could say, Okay, I want it to come to this particular project, uh, and I want it to import the MIDI files and retain their time position. You could say, okay, you know, it's this particular track, this track, and this track, and we could import the files and keep the timing absolute. So that may be a better option as well, but, you know, either we'll get the MIDI information there. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, how do I render chords from trigger pads directly on track, and why are they not in sync to chord pads? Um, so let's say if I have uh, chord pads here, so let's say I have my roads, and I go to my chord pads, and we'll activate it. Right, 
Let's get to a different project here real quick. Okay, so um, so how do I transfer chords from trigger pads directly on track, and why are they not in sync to chord pads? Okay, so if we come here, um, you know, all I want to do now is just Okay, so let's say I just had that. So, you know, we don't, re you know, we record kind of the output of what the chords is being uh, generated here is going to, that is what's recorded as opposed to the MIDI note that is causing, that is triggering the particular chord pads. So I'm just going to, but if you wanted to come over here, you could also just take the chord pads and just drop directly into, you know, the project like so. Uh, and then if you wanted to set chord pads for different voicings, you know, you could just come here. So you have different tensions and different So same chord, but just doing different voicings of it. So let me know if that makes sense. So you could always just drag. All right, so I just see a question, uh, just in case <clears throat> this wasn't clear from a previous answer uh, from Gareth and <clears throat> is asking Michael Pierce, uh, does MIDI zero export all the MIDI tracks in one file. So both will export all the MIDI tracks into a single file. Uh, type zero exported into a single track that you often have to explode by channel, which you could do from the dissolve part function. But uh, both of them will take all of the MIDI data, so. All right, so we have a question. Uh, if you set the display bar offset to two and then use MIDI trigger a groove agent pattern on bar one, which is set to do an autofill after eight bars, it appears to do the fill two bars early. So I, I think, yeah, and I think we discussed this before, uh, but we'll give it a shot and see. So let's say it will add a groove agent instance Come over here, say, okay, let's do our patterns. So let's say we do autofill every eight measures. All right, so let's say we'll have this set to follow transport. And we'll do our display bar offset. Okay, and let's say we start at measure one. Yeah, because this may not follow negative measures in Groove Agent here. So let's say if we start, it's 
still kind of reading the absolute time. Yeah, so, you know, this sequencer doesn't take into account uh, different offsets, so um, I'll, I'll pass that on again, just in case. All right. Okay, so you see a uh, question. I own Cubase 11 Pro. Is it worth buying WaveLab? I know there are different software, but does WaveLab give extra tools for the mastering part of the track? Uh, doesn't Cubase cover that? So, you know, WaveLab will have, a, you know, a lot of other specific tools that are kind of ideal for mastering. So we'll just kind of show a couple of them. One is, you know, to be able, you know, to do more spectral-based editing, so that's going to be a part of it. You could do some with, you know, ARA2, but inside of, um, let me just open up a quick project here, you know. So if you want it to, you know, do different restoration capabilities, but let's say if we were just kind of playing, you know, we could take uh, any number of files here and if we want it to you know check out and switch between my left and right or mid side so i could do editing on just the audio that's in the sides or the middle part of the panning spectrum uh, you get a number of you know pretty amazing plugins with wave lab as well so let me just So if we're here, so we have different. So even if I want to go to the master section, we'll have, you know, restoration tools. So if I wanted to come to like the master rig, and this will give us, you know, a multi-band limiter multi-band compressors, dynamic EQs, all kind of in one plug-in. If you want to have multi-band saturation and kind of like a multi-band imager, which you could do in Cubase now, but we could also choose for this to only, you know, do processing on the left channel or the mid channel or just on the sides. So, you know, being able to kind of process those particular, you know, effects for different channels or different uh, schemes, you know, so we could do that. Also, if we wanted to, you know, just come over here and, you know, I wanted to take this and let's do, uh, you know, like one of the plugins, if we want to do like an encoder checker. So, you know, what would this sound like uh, if I wanted to listen to the project, kind of encode it for iTunes or an MP3 at 128 or an MP3 at 320K. So I know what the encoding is actually doing. Hang on just one second. My son is knocking.
Sorry about that. So, you know, there's going to be encoder checker, CD burning, DDP image burning as well. So if you need to do that, plus if you wanted to do batch processing, uh, you know, there's going to be um, more audio assembly tasks with montages. So, you know, if you're just doing a single file, you might be okay. But when you want to actually process multiple files in WaveLab, it's really a very powerful tool for that. So if you're doing a lot of mastering, it's the best tool for working with that. All right. Reading through comments. All right, so I just see uh, from Ed Rugman just says, I have a Behringer touch and would like the wheel to remain Mackie, but the remaining buttons as controls I can customize, hence the selecting Mackie uh, as an output as an option. So, yeah, I understand. So, but it may not be physically set up for that as well. All right, we see Jazz Dude shared some track height key commands, so thanks for doing that. Right, you see some from Michael Pierce. It says, uh, thanks, Greg. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, uh, it was probably about the, I think, CLAP plugin format. It's kind of a bad name, I think. Uh, so it might have some great tech in it, though, but I'm not using any host that supports it, and I doubt Avid will, so probably not. So there's a lot of fantastic technology in VST3 that people just, uh, many plugin developers haven't actually utilized, so. All right, so we just see a question. Um, I'm not able to connect my uh, acoustic guitar to Cubase through my audio interface. Please help me. So I'm not sure if you are, you know, how it's connected. So if you're going into a microphone, if it's a condenser microphone, make sure that you have the uh, phantom power on your interface. If you're connecting it directly to the interface, you want to make sure that you, you know, make sure that you have a high Z input. Um, you know, so if it's a, if you have electronics in your acoustic interface and you're tracking through that, you may have to hit a high Z switch. But as you connect it in, you know, see if you have the audio signal, you probably have a signal meter on it. You want to make sure that Cubase is usually utilizing the particular interface. So, you know, ideally you want in, you know, not to plug it directly into like a sound card on a computer, but into an audio interface, which I assume you're doing, uh, cause you mentioned the word interface. So make sure that in the audio system that you have the ASIO or core audio driver selected. And then when you click there, you could, uh, just come to the VST connections under the studio. And then you could take the inputs, make sure that you have the inputs routed to inputs from your audio interface. And then when you go to add an audio track, you could choose where it's gonna be mono or stereo. So let's say mono. 
and I wanted to use you know this particular input of my audio interface and then we add track and then you want to this button will enable you to record and this button will allow, enable you to hear the recording as you're doing it if you're listening with headphones so and then at that point you know call the track guitar or whatever you want to call it and come right over here and then just hit record and that should send a signal from your audio interface into the correct input into the track that's record and monitored enabled and you should be all set Reading through comments. Thanks for all the great questions. All right, and we have Soren checking in from Sweden. So thanks for joining. Glad you could be a part of the community today. Uh, and one other comment, just on the acoustic guitar, if you, I see that you have, um, you have a jack for the guitar cord, make sure that you have a new battery, that your battery is working for that as well. So a lot of times the batteries get worn out, and then that could prevent the signal from going to your audio interface. My chat field just jumped on me, so. All right, so I think I'm in the ballpark where I was. All right, so we see Ali M, the fabulous Baker Boys just joined, so thanks for being part today of the live stream. All right, so we have a question. Um, hi, Greg, can you please explain pan law as elaborate as possible with respect to the time you can spare? Thanks in advance. Okay, so pan law is always kind of an interesting topic. Um, so I think I even have maybe a project to kind of show it. All right, so sometimes people will, and let me turn down the, all right, so sometimes people will, uh, you know, manipulate pan law so that things can sound often wider. So let's go ahead and just take a look. Let's say we have a, uh, a mono source here. So let's say, All right, and on this, I just have loaded up uh, different inserts of supervision. So let's say I have a test tone generator. All right, and that's kind of my, uh, on the channel itself. And let's say on this, I have a stereo track. Okay, so we'll open up. So we have a the same. Uh, so this is our mono track, our stereo track, and so we can see that roughly we're at you know minus twelve dB. Let me just 
Okay, so when we go to our pan law settings, which we could access in our project setup. Let me just see if I could. You know, so right now I'm gonna have this set to minus six dB, okay? So let me just turn this down. So we'll imagine we're hearing ever so slightly our test tone. All right, so now, as we adjust, let's say our, um, let's say our mono track, you know, and we pan it, we don't really see, I'll mute this, let's say, if we look at our stereo output, we can see that it's gonna be, you know, pretty consistent level wise as we do this, but let's say if we go to, I think if we go to our stereo track, and as we would pan, um, just see how to best to show this. Uh, see if I remember what I was setting up in the project. But basically, what the pan law is going to allow us to do is. Let's say if we come over here, let's get to. Okay, so we see that now when we pan, we're at minus six dB. And as we pan hard left or hard right, we can see that as we do this, it's basically increasing the pan loss. It's increasing the level. So as we want to pan from like, you know, left to right, we, if we want it to, you know, if we're going from like one sound and we double it, we can see that we're going from 12 dB to minus six dB. So a lot of people may use this just to actually manipulate, um, to make track sound wider. But what it actually does is it actually makes the, so if we come here, um, and let's say if we pan this, it what it is in essence is doing when we adjust the pan law. So I'm going to adjust the pan law here. And we'll say to minus 3 dB, and we hit OK. So now as we take our stereo track and we pan it, we notice that the pan is now going to be different. So what in essence, what the pan law allows you to do is to often make tracks sound wider. But what it does is it doesn't necessarily affect the uh, level of the outside panning. What it does is it takes the panning of the center channel and will decrease that. So some people will do it thinking that it's going to make their tracks sound wider but the tracks can sound wider, but if you're dealing with sources that are in the center, often you know, like mono channels in the center will actually, at that point, be softer. So when the center channel is softer and you have stuff panned out, that is kind of compensated for. So at that point, it could sound wider, but it sounds wider because elements that are in the center part of the panning spectrum are kind of dropped to compensate so that you could have varying levels as you pan across and combine two different sources. So, so it doesn't really necessarily affect the stereo, but more of the mono sources, and they will get attenuated to accommodate. All right, so we have a question. Um, I have a question. Is using a separate VST instrument, a Groove Agent 5, for each single percussion instrument the correct way forward? Even though we can assign outputs, is it better to load a new VST for each sound? Um, I don't think it's really necessary, and I think it could be very cumbersome in the mix console. So if I was doing that, I would just add an instrument track. Uh, so let's say we do the full Groove Agent here. And we'll just load a kit with patterns. 
So I think that once you come to like the percussion agent that, you know, once you come here, you know, to have, you know, sometimes you would want to have uh, a, you know, if you don't have flexibility for mixing or adding EQ for your different signal sources, let me just. So let's say, you know, as we're here, we have So, you know, when people would often need to split stuff out into separate channels is when they're, you don't have a mixer. So since Groove Agent, we can come over here and set up, you know, all of our different sounds in different channels and kind of have the processing. So instead of having to process everything together, you know, we could come here and just... You know, I wanted to now come here and put an EQ or let's say a compressor on just that particular sound. So, you know, once we do this, we could do kind of all of our signal processing internally directly from the particular agent. So I think having everything in one single, like the percussion agent, and being able to see all of your different sounds and be able to kind of change volumes with one mouse click instead of having to go to a different mixer, you know, and we could, you know, very easily come over here to our aux channels and say, okay, I want to add a reverb here. So, you know, so a lot of times people would split it out so you have more flexibility because the original source didn't have much flexibility. But here I could just say, okay, I wanted to come to this particular agent. And as we're playing, I could just, you know, add reverb to the one source without affecting the others. So, you know, I would say for 99% of the cases, you could mix internally and there's no need to split out the individual sounds from uh, the percussion agent or groove agent into separate tracks. All right, we see Mark Rabin from Wisconsin. So thanks for joining us. I see Pano is just saying, I think he thinks my son needs drums. Yeah, his movie ended. So I have an electronic drum kit that he could play on. All right, so we have a question. Uh, what is the latest version of Cubase? Uh, it is 12.03. That's the current version. Okay, so we see a uh, follow-up question to Greg about Halion pads. Uh, how can I transfer or record chords from the Halion pads to a track and how to sync those to Halion pads with chord pads? All right, so let me open up just a quick instance of Halion. Okay. Let's see if I can get the pads in SE. All right, so I think there's some, if we get to
we try just uh, how you in Sonic. I think I may have a one that's kind of loaded up by default in Howie and Sonic. Bear with me just a second. One of these would have the chords, but okay, so that's a okay. So let's see if these are recorded straight in. So Okay, so let's see if we could So, you know, I think that generally these chord pads from the instrument are independent of the chord pads here. this off and okay so let's come over here Okay, so let's say if I just want to sign these, let's see if we do C1. All right, so now I think I'm just gonna record the particular note. Okay, so so now that I've triggered it here, okay, so it's recorded the chord. Um, so again, it's not really, I think that these chord pads are intended to be different, but let's say if I, take this and if I have the event, we go to, chord track and create chord of events that then we could you know we could make a chord event from the chord recorded from the pad and drag that directly over so if I say okay let's you know I wanted this particular chord you know we could trigger that it will record it in Cubase as the chord, do a, from the project menu to make, create chord symbols, and then you could drag that chord symbol, you know, that's been created directly to the chord pads there. So let me know if I'm misunderstanding, but I don't think that it's like, you know, drag these particular chords 
you know, from, you know, from to and from each other. So they have kind of similar functions, but they're not really connected per se. Okay, so we see Mark Raven's got uh, pretty far in a new song of Terrapin Station yesterday, today's lead guitar, congratulations. It's always great to be able to make progress. All right, so I just see, uh, hi, greetings. Halion Sampler is in this product. So with uh, Cubase, you get Halion Sonic SE. So it's kind of the, a scaled down version of Halion, more of a player, so it's not the sampler but it will play back Halion uh, compatible libraries, so. Okay, just kind of reading through questions. Okay, so we see a question from Walter Blackledge. Uh, uh, Greg, when I'm uh, I'm using Razor and the output from my classical recordings works great. Question: What if any Steinberg compressor should I use on individual string tracks as well? Um, so a lot of times, you know, strings can benefit you know, just from, you know, for, you know, I'm not sure if it's like a orchestral thing or if you're adding strings to a pop song. Um, but a lot of times, you know, people may kind of, you know, do dynamics on the output stage, but, you know, it's pretty common to let the dynamics stand from the individual parts. So if you're doing audio or sequencing parts, realize that probably a lot of the samples have been compressed already. So, you know, it's pretty common not to use a lot, you know, generally people might, you know, take like a string section, like if you had like a pop song and you had strings come in, you know, people may compress the, if you have multi-track recordings, they may compress like a group bus to kind of add cohesion to kind of make it sound like it's, you know, all sitting together pretty well. Uh, but a lot of times if you're doing MIDI programming, a lot of the source material, you know, doesn't have those anomalies and it's kind of designed to give you that sound. So you could probably get by on individual string parts, but you know, if it's going to be, uh, for classical recordings, you, you know, you think of the musicians are probably, you know, doing their own dynamics and may not benefit from a compressor. All right, so we have Janice, uh, all right, Sam, just sending love from India. So thanks for being on the live stream. All right. All right, and we have Tomek checking in from Poland. Thanks for being here today. And thermonuclear war from Serbia. All right, so we see Jeff Stavelsky just saying that the Raven piano with the concert experience is awesome. So it's great. It's a lot of great content there. See, Gareth is uh, using Groove Agent a lot this week for his projects, with uh, including the effects and routing. Great stuff.
All right, so we see uh, in Halion, we have output under program and under mix, please explain. So let me just take a quick, I'll just open up Halion. I'm not sure if it's Halion Sonic or Halion, so. All right, so come over here to instrument. Let's go to Halion. Sorry, this one takes a little while to load up in the first time. Okay, so you see uh, in Halion, we have output under program and mix. Um, all right, so let me just... Okay, so let's say if I wanted to come here, all right, so we have, and so we'll come here to our percussion map. Okay, so let's say, um, Okay, so let's say we have, I see output. So, you know, here we could have the program bus. So when we have program, this could, you know, if we're building sounds, so let's say if we're building a sound that's synthesizer plus sample plus wavetable, and we have kind of all of these different information. So we could have a program bus which would allow us to, you know, take all of a combination of all those different sounds and be able to route them to like the program so we could combine multiple different sound sources, you know, whether it's a sample or a synthesizer directly on the particular um, you know, on a particular and if we wanted to at this stage, you know, let's say if we wanted to add like you know a compressor effect i think we could add it here so let's say new fx so we could say okay i wanted to now add a studio eq to the program bus um so this way we could kind of you know combine multiple different sounds together and let me just come over here and I'll just try maybe like an anima preset. Right, hang on just one second. The sun is knocking. So I think that's why you'll see, you know, if you're sending it to the program, that that would allow you to do, you know, further processing. So let me just see if I come over to a sound that might be able to kind of show it a bit more. But so you could have, you know, different levels of effect processing going on within that particular chain. And then you have mix outputs, which would, I believe, just be the outputs that are feeding the particular mixer. So you could do different kind of routing. Uh, so you can see like this effect, you know, this, this instrument. And if we had multiple 
different sound sources layered. They could each sound source could have its own effects processing. Then you have a program bus for all of its effects routings, and then the mix would be. I think once we're here, that you could just set the output of going to you know whatever particular uh, you know output that you have defined for the multiple outputs as well. Okay, reading through. Um, All right, so a question. Uh, hi, how to fix a vocal if recording with beat on Cubase 10? Uh, how to monitor it? Um, so if you have a audio file that you, you know, so let's come over here, we'll add a track. So, and we want to start recording. Um, you know, so if we have, I'll just do a new project here just to. All right, and I'll just throw kind of a loop in. Okay, so let's say we have this loop and we drag it out here. And I wanted to now just add an audio track and just kind of like we discussed a bit earlier about, you know, making sure that your VSD connections are set. We could define your input for your audio interface here. Uh, and so we could play this particular loop. And like we may not, if you had the microphone connected, you may not hear the microphone until this is actually uh, set to monitor. Now, one preference that can often help is if you go to your uh, VST preferences and you set the auto monitoring style to tape machine style. So that way, uh, as soon as you're recording, we can just come over here. It's, it's not monitoring, but now when you record, the monitor will automatically turn on for you. So, and then you'll be able to hear the source that you're recording. And if you have your headphones set up, you know, with your audio interface, probably by default, then the outputs here will be routed to your headphones, but those won't be recorded unless your headphones are so loud that it's bleeding into the, uh, the vocal microphone. But generally that won't actually record it. Okay, so we have a question from Stephen Butler. Uh, I'm a big fan of Very Audio 3. I get snapping to absolute pitch, but I've never grasped the significance of snapping to relative pitch, relative to what? All right, so let's go ahead and we'll jump back to a project. So when there's two different modes, when we do Very Audio, so you mentioned kind of snapping to pitch, which is probably the most practical. Um, but let's say it, we're in very audio here and we'll activate it. All right, so when we have our pitch snap mode set to relative, let's say that this note was, you know, when we look at it, we could say, you know, this note was pretty, you know, like in between. So if we, you know, if we have this kind of snapped to different notes. So if this was like 37 cents flat and we had this set to uh, relative and I move it up, that would make it flat on the next. So it would be the same level of being out of tune, but one semitone up, but exactly the same. So it would keep the relative position of the tuning. So if, you know, let's say you're doing kind of maybe uh, like going for a blues note and you want it like a note to still be the same amount of flat or sharp as you move it up, that's what relative would do and what absolute would do. And I agree it's not very practical musically, but it could be one of those things like, oh, you know, give, a, give customers the option. So now when we move, it's going to snap 
to the pitch. And, you know, if we have it in between pitches, so now when we go to put it in relative mode, it'll still be the same amount out of tune, but just up a, a half or a whole step. So for a couple of years, and I, I kind of lobbied hard for this, it was default to uh, relative mode. So everyone would just kind of come over here and expect to do like a pitch snap, and it would move it up like, you know, it's still flat, but it, now it's just a wrong note and flat. So that's why the default mode was switched to absolute, and it almost came back in version 12. But I, I sent a lot of emails and correspondence to Germany to make sure that that would default to absolute, which is more practical. So relative keeps it the same amount out of tune, but moves it exactly one semitone up or down as you move the notes, but still the same amount out of tune. So... There's not many musical cases for that, but, you know, it's an option. All right, so we just see uh, from Best Korean Jesus, uh, wondering when Groove Agent kits go on sale. So, you know, they, there's kind of always sales kind of throughout the year going on. So, you know, currently there's a Wave Lab promotion. So there's always, you know, different promotions that are going on. So... All right. Um, all right. So we see, uh, Greg, what are the main advantages? Question of what are the main advantages of using a control room? Is it necessary when I create music in my room, having only audio interfaces, mixer, and two external synths? Thanks. Some of the advantages that you'll get is, um, and I'll just revert this quickly just so you get an idea, you know. One is as if you wanted to audition different sounds or loops, you're gonna have the ability to audition through the control room because like as we would add, you know, we have, you know, different sounds here, you know, these aren't assigned to a particular track. So we, as we're working with this, you know, we could just have these kind of automatically play back you know, one of the big distinctions is, and, you know, I get this question a lot, like, okay, just have a stereo out audio interface. I'm not routing to multiple speakers. Does the control room make sense? So, you know, if we are using, let's say I'm here, many people will use, like, the master fader as almost the, um, the monitoring level. So... People, if you have like kind of maybe bad gain structure set up, and if you're here, you may, you know, and if you bring the level down, just because your speakers are monitored loudly, when you go to export, you're actually attenuating, you're telling the program to drop the volume of the mix by minus 20 dB. So we don't want to necessarily couple the monitoring level with the gain structure of the mixer so with the control room i could set different volume levels and still we see that my main mix output is going to be the same and it's not affected and this is just simply a monitoring stage as we work with that now other things that are helpful in the control room is down mix presets. So if I'm here, I want to listen to this in mono. Or stereo or you know 51 to quad to stereo to mono to see how it's going to fold down. You have that capability. Also as we're kind of working um, you know like we could solo different components. So let's say I have uh, my reverence here, and if I solo the reverence, it solos the source tracks, but we have what we call a listen bus. So now I could listen to only what's going on in that reverb channel. 
and now I could make critical reverb decisions just listening to the reverb without hearing all the other source tracks feeding it. And we could also just do this on an individual track as well. So let's say I'm hearing a vocal, so we could solo. But if I click, and that mutes everything, but maybe I want everything else to go down. So we could just click on the L button. So now all the air tracks, instead of So instead of muting all the tracks, we could just listen to this louder and we could adjust this level of the dim right here. So we could say, okay, every time that I want to solo, or I just want everything else to be dimmed down, we could do that using kind of the listen bus. So a lot of handy things, even if you, you know, aren't using multiple speakers with the control room. All right, we see Graham Witcher checking in from Royal Wooten Bassett, Wooten Bassett. All right, so we see, is WaveLab 12 released? No, uh, so WaveLab was updated last week to 11.1, uh, and that has migrated to the new Steinberg licensing scheme. So there's some new features, a lot of maintenance stuff. Uh, it's Apple Silicon native, uh, but it's 11.1, and it's under the new licensing scheme. So under Steinberg licensing. So, but it's still not at version 12. Um, since that came out shortly before the new licensing, they wanted to make sure that customers didn't have to wait till version 12 to not utilize the USB e licensor. All right. Wonderful to see Tiago from Brazil. He's probably the only one that doesn't have super hot weather, being in the southern hemisphere, perhaps. Okay, so we see a message from Steve McRae. He's an incredibly talented keyboardist. Uh, says, hi, Greg. Purchased Cubase Pro 12 upgrade last week. Really enjoying the new features and improvements. Still going through it all. Uh, it was a seamless upgrade from... All right. All right, so we have a question from Matt Elliston. Uh, question, Greg, please. Which Steinberg audio interface would you recommend for output 5.1, please, into five monitors with sub? I'm looking at the UR816C. Would this be a sensible choice? Yeah, the, some of the interfaces that were like really well suited for this have been, uh, were kind of victims of part shortages. So the UR816 is a great choice. Uh, if you could find one or the AXR series, so those have eight analog outputs. That's what I use. I use an AXR4U in my studio, um, and that's why I feed my stereo and 5.1 monitors with. All right, we see Jason Genova joining us, and you don't have to worry about being late. Just if you're late, you just have to hit the like button. That's all. Just see a comment from uh, from Graham Witcher, just saying uh, Cubase 12 Pro is the only DAW you will ever need. There's so much in there, one may never get to use all of its features. Um, Cubase is the universe, and what you use is just a galaxy. So that's a good way of thinking about it. I I often liken it to learning a, a new musical instrument. Like you know, you just don't 
start being a, an expert at piano or guitar or French horn on the first day. So, all right. So I think I'm at the end of questions so far, but let's go ahead. And I know I had some questions that were emailed in. So let's go to those. If you learn something new, make sure you do hit the like button. So, All right, so someone was watching the live stream last week, and I think we had a question uh, about the volume envelopes. So let's say if we wanted to come here and have pre-gain volume where we could just draw in and we see the waveform reflections. This might have been from uh, Best Korean Jesus had brought this up saying okay we want to just come here and he liked the ability to see the particular you know reaction of the waveform and this is almost like kind of early early versions of cubase what they call dynamic events so we could just kind of you know do uh, different editing but the question came up of how to remove those points you know when we go to a race and we go to erase a point, it erases the entire event. So how to erase those particular events. Uh, so this is one of those that's always kind of hiding in plain sight. If you select the event, go to audio, and then click on remove volume curves, and then you'll be right back. So if we wanted to undo that, so again, select the event, and if we have the, the pencil tool selected, we can see the blue lines, but to get rid of that, uh, those changes, go to audio and remove volume curve. Okay, so uh, question. I recently purchased a VST sound and loop collection, downloaded it and installed it via the library manager and activated it. I think there are about seven-ish sound sets in the bundle, but my problem is where are they? They do not show up in the library manager. They also do not show up in either Halion or Halion Sonic. Can you please tell me where I could find them? Uh, I'm running Cubase Pro 12. Okay, so generally I think that, you know, there's a kind of, there's some marketing materials on new sound and loop sets. Um, so if we come over here to the media bay, generally these will be just, you know, generic audio file so they're not really tied to a particular instrument so what i would do is come over here to the loops and sounds and then you'll probably see them classified here so since it's not a halion preset or groove agent preset or backbone pad shop you know you'll probably just find the content sets here so you can say okay i just wanted to now come over and say, okay, let's go to Soul Assembly and you can see your different loop sets that you could access directly there. So look, not in the instruments, but uh, when we go to the media bay, we will go home to loops and samples. And now we can come over here to content and see the different loops there. So that's probably where they will show up. All right, uh, so he says, um, question. Hi, Greg, thanks for your videos and tips. I heard a podcast where a mixing engineer told that it's possible within Cubase to switch with one knob from mix A to mix B, maybe uh, to use with different drum samples. Can you describe the workflow, please? Perhaps it's similar to like how QSENs or different channel routings uh, and so, you know, the one thing that you could do is let's, we'll just jump back to maybe the Amos Moses project here. So I'm not, you know, there isn't like a magic AB button, but you know, maybe they were talking about using uh, like mixed console snapshots. So if you don't have a lot of automation, um, like a lot of times what I, when I'm kind of starting a particular project,
you know, and let's say if I'm just starting a mix project, I'll bring kind of like everything down to zero. So let's say I'll just come here and I'll just put this on Q link and we'll put in absolute mode. Okay. So I'm not doing like extensive automation yet. I'm just kind of maybe building rough balances. So let's say, okay, I'm here and we're playing. Okay, and let's say, okay, I want my. I'll probably have snares here. All right, and we'll have toms. And let's say overheads. So maybe I want to temporarily link these. So we'll put this into quick link. And let's say, okay, let's bring in All right, so if I really like this particular, like maybe I'll just take this and I'm gonna take a snapshot. So I click on a camera. Okay, so now what I could do, and we could give that a name. So I'm going to select all of my tracks again. And let's put it in Q-Link. The absolute all right so now i want to build a completely different mix so we'll come here like i just want to maybe start with vocals or I'll kind of bring everything up to an equal level all right so now i'm going to take off the cue link And I could do this with effects. All right, then I could take a snapshot again. So if I wanted to just come right over here and just switch and say, oh, what was mix snapshot one sounding like? I could go there and what does mix console snapshot two? And this will take into account all of your effects, panning, inserts. So at that point we could just go back and forth between different mix console snapshots and see which one you like best. So, and just like a picture doesn't necessarily, sh you know, have dynamic information like a movie does, at this point we can see uh, you know, the snapshots aren't going to include automation. So when I'm kind of building a mix like this, before I have a lot of stuff automated, I will just kind of, you know, bring everything down. I think it sounds great, you know, and then we all have that element, that moment of, you know, is this great or really terrible? Uh, so when you're at that stage, bring everything down, start all over again, take a snapshot before and start all over again and see if you come up with something better. Uh, and then when you get to recording, recalling different snapshots, I could say, you know what, I want to only take, so let's say we're in snapshot one. Okay, but I want to take the bass track here. And I will go to say, I want to do only the selected channels. So we could now come over here and say, okay, I just want to take this one selected channel and we could just recall the snapshot two of just the bass or I want a different snapshot for the drums and we could mix and merge different snapshots if you wanted to as well. So, and if it's kind of with more, you know, another aspect could be AB with plugins. So, you know, if you wanted to come here and you had two different plugin stages, you know, you could say, okay, I have this preset here. So we will come and say, okay, let's take that particular preset 
And now we could actually, you know, save kind of A, B settings. So I think if we come here, um, so you could say switch to B setting. So let's say now I wanted to recall this preset and now you could just say switch to A setting switch to B setting. So you could do that independently on different effects as well. So those are two ways of doing A to B switching. But if you have a link to the podcast, I might be able to listen to it and see if there is uh if he was if the producer was kind of referring to something else. All right, so we had a question. Uh, could you possibly do a section on the next live stream um, about the tempo track? Uh, I know how it works. In fact, I use it, but it always seems so difficult. Uh, I struggle to get the tempo values I want in the places I want them to be. Uh, the resolution of the track doesn't seem to be large enough to for precise inputting of the tempo I want. Uh, and additionally, the bars seem to jump all over the place as I attempt to draw in my changes. Uh, it's just not as easy as I think it should be. All right, so let's take a look at our tempo uh, track here. So I will just kind of add a track. So I'll just right click and let's add a tempo track. Okay, so one of the things is, you know, when we, we can activate our tempo track. When we see here, depending on your tempo range, you know, we could say, you know, so some people may draw in, you know, tempo values here. So let's say, okay, at this point, I want tempo to be that fast and I want it to be, so you may come over here and find that the particular value, you know, as you move it up or down, like if it's not as precise as you want, this is when you could use like, you know, the info line. So anytime that you select a value, you know, you could just say, you know, I want this to be not 135.413, you know, I want this to be 136. So you could just double click here and go to 136. And then at that point, so, you know, think of, you know, looking at the values directly in the info line as well as kind of a reference. So if you wanted to come here, you know, maybe it's not as, you know, as we do this, it's kind of going down one BPM at a time, but maybe you want, you know, 136, you know, 145.123. So enter that value in the info line. Now, if you're doing slower projects, you may also want to adjust. Like you may do, you know, look at your tempo and go, oh, I have a slow project and it's all kind of off screen. So you could adjust kind of the, you know, like the lowest tempo value that you want here and the highest tempo value to kind of fit. Now, sometimes, you know, this is really like a quick aid, maybe even more of a visual aid having it in the track. But if we come over to the transport, I think we could do, um, or it's just shift T. Let me see if that's the right, or um, control T. And control T will bring up kind of the tempo track editor is kind of a full screen editor as well. So just hit Control T, and then you could see kind of, you know, very precise tempo uh, change information directly here. Now, like when, you know, working with tempo values on the project window, you know, one thing that people can sometimes get confused with is as, you know, we could select, if we have kind of the combined tool engaged, um, you know, I could select a tempo range and move the range of tempos. Um, and if I wanted to, you know, we have, but if I select the tempo events, like going from the bottom 
then I could get some additional functions for I want to, you know, come here and slow down or speed up the tempo, or I want to do more of a crescendo or more of a day crescendo, or I wanted this to be more compressed or expanded. You could adjust these particular settings right here, but you, whether you select kind of the range that includes tempo information or from the top, or if you select from the bottom where you actually select the tempo events. So whether it's in range selection mode or object selection mode, just be aware of that as well. All right, so hopefully that should help. All right, uh, so we had a question. Uh, Hi, Greg, is there any way to slide the waveforms in the sample editor to left or right, same as on the clip by pressing Alt and Control? Uh, it's a lot easier for precise positioning on large waveforms. Um, uh, view then uh, then enlarge the track height and width every time I uh, want to send back. So what I would do is just double click here. Um, and you know we kind of talked about it a bit. So let's say I'm on you know this particular track. So I'm gonna just zoom to the event. So as I work with this, you know, one thing that a lot of people miss is, let's say, okay, I have all of these tracks. Let me just show something that might be a little more, okay. So when we see our waveform here, you know, we have kind of a waveform overview. So if I want to see different parts, we could just go, you know, if we're zoomed in a particular view at this point, um, you know, we could navigate. So let's say I just want to look at that particular part. And if we just hover in the, you know, instead of navigating to the left or right, um, you know, what we could do, you know, we could choose our different events here. So let's say I want to just see just these particular events. And then like as we want to navigate, we could just for like precise editing, we can come right over here and navigate just like that. You know, when we take our events here and let's say we hold down like alt and control and slip, we're actually moving these in time. But if we go from the top here uh, in the little preview area, at this point we could see and navigate, just zoom in so it's a little easier, you know, but we can navigate here just by, sorry, making it something simple, making it look hard. And so we could just kind of navigate accordingly here. So we could just say, okay, I just want to take this and navigate earlier or later. And if we're zoomed in a bit, again, just kind of come to the preview zone and where you are, just navigate like that. So hopefully that will help. All right, and we had, uh, I think Michael Finlayson had sent a project in for us to do like tempo detection on, and it was something where we couldn't necessarily do kind of typical tempo detection wasn't working as expected. And let me talk to my son just for a second, hold on. All right, I'm just gonna get something on TV for my son to watch real quick. Sorry, school is over, so bear with me just for a minute.
All right, sorry about that. So I'm back. So let's go ahead and take a listen to uh, this example here. And we had some guitar parts. So let's say if we listen to our guitar, and so like this is something that tempo detection uh, wasn't picking up on. So, so let's go ahead and I'll just do a new version and we'll show how we could do some quick, how to create a tempo map. And I'm going to just kind of zoom the waveform here a little bit. I'll move the tempo track down below. So this is kind of a, a, a different feel. So it's kind of like a dotted half note feel. So what we could do is um, I'm going to switch to my warp grid and we're going to use the warp tool. And we can see that we're going to have kind of our lines here. So let's say, and let's set our meter here quickly to four, four. Okay, so, so what I want to do, first thing I'm going to do is when we go to our, our warp grid and we do the warp grid as opposed to free warp because what we want to do is not, we say this is where measure two is. So I'm gonna drag measure two directly to here and I'm gonna hold down, uh, I think it's alt plus shift And let me see if it's just control plus shift. So, and so I'm gonna start to drag and we say measure two starts there. All right, so as we do this, and if I do the right note, that would help. So we say measure two starts here. So I'm gonna grab measure two and just move it directly to that point. Measure three. And we could do this, you know, beat by beat if we want it to, or just, And we can see that there's gonna be subtle tempo changes there. So just kind of grabbing the bars and moving it. So, and I kind of went through and kind of did this whole process uh, and I'll just show this as a quick uh, tempo variation. So I went through this particular process and now we I think I may have added a point there. So let's, so, you know, just kind of doing that manually So at this point, you know, we could just, you know, adjust the tempo and for each individual one. So that's uh, how you could kind of work with your different tempo maps and create tempo maps if tempo detection isn't picking up on it. All right, so let's jump back to our live questions here. And again, if you learned something new, make sure you do hit the like button. Sorry, yeah. Sorry, the news turned on for me. All right. All 
All right, we see Gerald Ely from California on. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we see a question about VST Live again, trying to paste an entire text, uh, but the first four lines are pasted. What am I doing wrong? So I don't think that, um, I haven't really gotten into the lyrics feature. I just kind of got my copy of it the other day, um, but I could I could probably have an answer for you on uh, Friday to see. But I, I think you might have to you know put the text in more manually, you know, so that it's aligned with the timing. Okay, so we see a uh, question. Um, I, I purchased Absolute and don't see a whole lot more in instrument packs. Where can I find a list of libraries that were supposed to come with it? All right, so a lot of them will show up in the particular instruments themselves. So many of the you know uh, content will show up inside of Halion Sonic SE or inside of you know Halion. If you if you have the, you know so. Sometimes you may not notice it in. So if we come over here to our VST instruments, you could say, okay, uh, when I go to, you know, uh, under Halion, and then we could say, okay, with that pack, I've got the electric bass, and the electric bass may show up directly inside of Halion. So a lot of the content may not show up as individual instruments, but when you go to the instrument and go to the categories here, at this point, you could just double click and say, oh, okay, here is all the content from that particular uh, instrument set. So the absolute content may be showing up in the instruments as opposed to like a dedicated, you know, instead of seeing the electric bass here uh, under instruments, it would show up as a sound set for Halion. So check that out but if you wanted to see where all of the content uh you know if you've downloaded it uh, if you go to this download assistant so like you know the, the electric bass howling and symphonic orchestra that will all show up uh inside of howling but we'll take a look through some of the other absolute instruments so we'll come here so um so yeah the halion six obviously the groove agent the grand that shows up as its own instrument patch op um retro log you have the content there backbone is its own instrument uh, Amped Electra Dark Planet Electric Bass Halion Symphonic Orchestra Olympic uh, choir micro sounds those all show up as Halion instruments you have sounds of soul I think that's going to be uh, different loops granular guitars that's a pad shop polarities is pad shop zero gravity so future past perfect I think is just loops as well so some of them will be loops some will be like different instruments that different sound sets for particular instruments and you'll see them once you go to those particular instruments Okay, so I just see kind of reference to another question. Let me just see if I could. Find the first question. Okay, so I just see uh, this is directed to Jazz Dude from uh, Perry Michael Allen. Uh, says thanks, but when I imported that way, the tempo and signature didn't transfer with all the other tracks. That's why I asked. 
uh, before I start clicking around. Thanks again. So maybe, uh, Perry, if you want to ask, if, I'm not sure if it's like with a MIDI file. Um, so if we go to, sorry if I missed the first question, but if you go to preferences on MIDI file import, so let's go to MIDI preferences, MIDI to MIDI file. Uh, here we could, you know, I think a lot of times by default, Cubase is set to ignore master track events on merge. Um, so if it's with a MIDI file, make sure that that isn't enabled. So if you want like a tempo track and signature tracks, you know, translated from a different program or from a MIDI file there. You see Gareth K. Music says whack alike. All right. All right, we see that Graham Witcher is about the new hot mess of record from Bandcamp. So that's great. Thanks for your support. We see that because the two people that bought the Bandcamp album that, you know, it, it paid for our t-shirts, our band t-shirts for the group photo, so, which would all be separate probably and merge together. We'll have to all get together and meet sometime in person. Okay, just, sorry, my chat field jumped. Okay, so we see, um, Greg, what does Razor do that Maximizer doesn't? Uh, what is the difference? So we could think of Razor as gonna be a, a you know, a very fast, um, you know, it's gonna be a much faster limiter. So as it's being kind of used, so let's say if we jump here, Just revert. All right, so say. So let's come over here to dynamics. So, you know, it's kind of different flavors. So when we come to the razor, you know, this can, you know, handle like different transients differently. So when we go to the real, you know, so we'll come over here, I'll just put on. So this. And this has kind of inner, you know, so if you wanted to come over here and have it automatically detect intersample clipping. Um, so if we wanted to go to maximizer, so again, two kind of different flavors, you know, they both can make it louder. Listen to like the transients. They're a little better preserved, I think, maybe in the razor.
So you could get kind of similar sounds, but you know, this is, you know, especially like for sometimes you may have distortion kind of between samples and this could, you know, Razor can automatically detect and handle that and kind of look for that in different scenarios. So, but they both sound great and could be used for different stuff. We appreciate Jazz Dude's moderation. So, and Agent K, thanks guys for being so good. Okay, so we just see uh, from question, um, why is there not a compressed comparison chart to show what comes with Cubase Pro 12 in absolute? So I think it's just gonna be in the, um, you know, you could see pretty easily going into the Steinberg Download Assistant. So if you wanted to see what is different in the two different versions, so you know if you go to your Cubase, so you could kind of so it may not be listed because you know they're not kind of so you could see all the content sets and instruments and the instrument content that comes there, and then if you go to the VST instruments and go to Absolute Five you could see these particular sounds and contents that come there. So if you want, I could type up a comparison list, Brian, if you want to email me. But it should be pretty easy to see what's, what is the same and what's different between them. All right, so we see uh, Master Assistant in Ozone 9. Uh, will WaveLab get something similar to locate mistakes of a whole song? Um, so, you know, in WaveLab, you do have the ability to do a global analysis. So this has been in WaveLab and it's many mastering engineers' best friends. So I'm not familiar with that particular feature, but if it's looking for mistakes of a whole song, you know, if you're in... Wave Lab, let's say we'll come over here to projects. And let's say I just wanted to take a particular so say if I want to take this um So if we go to the analyze process, there is a global analysis. So this, and here we could determine, you know, what, if there's any peaks. Um, so, and we could, you know, automatically find peaks and it could actually show, um, you know, if you wanted to show, you know, where the, you know, particular peaks are, you could do that. You could also, come over here to determine loudness, um, but also when you come here to errors, so we can say, okay, 10 points, and we want to automatically focus, and it could just go directly to any digital audio errors that are in the file. So let me know if it's something similar to that, uh, but that's a function that's been in WaveLab for 20 some years.
So Kerwin just saying Razor is an excellent limiter, so that's great. All right, so we see Captain Energy Music on. Okay, so I just see uh, from Benny, and I think we answered this before about the pasting of the lyrics in. Um, so I haven't had a chance to do that function yet. I was kind of fun, you know, learning other functions of VST Live, so I'm not sure if it's that the lyrics, uh, only so many lyrics can be pasted in a certain amount of time or not. Um, but I could, I'll play with it over the weekend and hopefully have an answer for Tuesday's live stream. All right. Okay. Okay, so I think I am caught up. We know it's a Friday in summer, so there's probably not as many people on a Friday night, but we'll see if there's more questions that come in. Appreciate everyone's great questions, and I hope that everyone has learned a new tip or trick. We'll just wait a little bit, and we got through our questions that were kind of mailed in. I'll just go to my other monitoring computer, see if that's coming through. Okay, we see that Best Green Jesus learned more about um, All right, so we have a question from uh, Brian. Um, it says, I do a lot of 5, 4, and 6, 8 time. Do you know if any of those libraries have those tempos for drums? Um, so I think those signatures, if you wanted to, like within Groove Agent, so I, I don't think there, there's many 5, 4 uh, patterns, um, but to determine, you could just come over to, let's say if we have uh, an instance a groove agent you know one of the things that you could look for let's say if we come over here to patterns is you could choose to search for patterns and you could set if for musical to signature and now you could say okay i'm looking for patterns in seven eight or thirteen eight or three four or six eight so um so if you just kind of look you know, most of the drum loops are going to be probably, you know, you may see some in 6-8, but the vast majority will be in 4-4 four, four for kind of loop-based music, you know, which is predominantly, you know, you don't see many dance productions in 5-4. But, you know, within Groove Agent, you can find patterns that you could come over here. So some, there will be some 5-4 pattern six eight but you know it's probably not going to be the main focus of you know different uh different loops and and presets but there are some in there
Okay, so we see from uh, Michael Teams, um, his question is, when I when I tried the MIDI export to screen that came up, I didn't get, uh, I, I got a song different from the one we were working on. One more time, please. Okay, so let's say if I wanted to take, um, I'll take the B someone here. So let's say I want to export this as a MIDI file. So let's go ahead and activate this. Okay, so let's say, you know, we have, we mute this, we're gonna have like strings and guitar, everything else is MIDI, except for drums. So if I want to export this as a MIDI file, I'll go, go to my file menu and we'll say export MIDI. And here it may, you know, so I will just call this um, be someone, give it a name. Okay, and I'll save it to my desktop. Okay, so now we'll say save. All right, so we'll get these options, usually using the default um, is good. So we'll come over here and hit, so, and we can say song name for type. So it's okay just to type in be someone here. And often this might be like, if you had a hardware MIDI sequencer that had a floppy disk drive that you could open up by name and that information, that data it will be stored. Okay, so now if I wanted to do, let's say import MIDI file. All right, it says, do you wanna create a new project? I'll create a new project and let's go to desktop. And I'll select the be someone, the file we just created. And it'll ask us what folder we want the project to be in. And now I could see my piano data. I could see the bass as well as the guitar. You know, uh, if I wanted to have my string quartet, I could now have kind of all of those parts. So that's how you could do a MIDI file export. So we have some more comments. Let me read through some. So let me know if that works for you, Michael. See, great comment from Best Green Jesus is saying, uh, better than asking a bad question like mine, I asked how to make a logical editor preset for an already existing command in Cubase. So if, if you could do it in a logical editor, that's fine. You know, however you get there is good. As long as you get to the, the finish line, that's the important thing. All right, so we have a question. Hi, Greg. In Cubase 12, uh, could you please explain the difference uh, between using ADAT and internal clock sources? So generally, when we do this, uh, we go to your studio setup, and when you come here, you could see the clock source. And this could depend upon uh, your audio interface. So if you have like digital connections, a BNC word clock, an ADAT digital connection, or AES-EBU, you could choose for Cubase to use the internal clock. So, you know, where Cubase is kind of the master, but if you're connecting an audio, let's say if you have a master clock or you're connecting a digital mixer or, you know, a digital mixer via ADAT light pipe, you may want to synchronize the clocks between the digital mixer and Cubase. Otherwise you may have just a recording that's just a bunch of, it sounds like that. 
Um, so with that, so, you know, if you're not, you know, sometimes you could have a hardware setting for that, but sometimes different clocks could have different sounds. Some people use, you know, special master clocks and have everything in a studio kind of, you know, follow the internal clock of one device and they feel that it tightens up the sound. Often it doesn't really make a, a difference in the exported file, uh, but some people like the, you know, added benefits. So if you wanted to, you know, like clock, have the master clock be driven from something connected to the ADAT input, the AES input, the SPDIF input, or BNC word clock input, you could just adjust it there. So sometimes you may, like if you have a, a mic pre with a, you know, that's going ADAT out into your audio interface, you may have the, you know, the mic pre may just automatically clock from the, from the ADAT connection so that those two clocks are synchronized. So sometimes it can make a difference sonically, um, you know, and sometimes it just makes a difference sonically monitoring, but not on your exported file. So those are some things to consider and you could choose what the master clock source is. So if you're not doing a lot of stuff uh, that's connected to the ADAT digital input, then those settings will often be irrelevant. See, Jazz Dude, just a great comment. Trust Cubase, it could do the job for you. So I remember uh, Craig Anderton, kind of famous journalist for many years. He's like, if any program can do it, it would be Cubase. You know, it's a, it was just kind of an interesting quote. And he used to work for Cakewalk and Sonar for a long time. Uh, so we see, hi, Greg, is there a way to turn off the scroll wheel to control faders or track volume? I tend to scroll down my track list and land on a volume cube on a track, uh, changing the volume and didn't realize. So one of the things, so there isn't a way to do it because it's just kind of deemed like a, you know, a, you know, a way to adjust parameters. So, you know, I've kind of asked for like a way to you know, ignore mouse wheel, but if you find that you do have tracks that accidentally moved, you know, you can come over here and instead of control Z, you could just hit alt Z and that will do a undo of just the mix console. So if you come over here, uh, so let's say if I added a number of tracks and let's say you just screwed up and you just accidentally are coming over here, adjusting the pan, move here and you just adjust it. And you're like, oh, I just totally messed everything up. If you come here to the edit history, you could actually see, okay, I changed this parameter here and you have an independent history for the mix console as opposed to an independent that's that's independent of the edits. So if you accidentally do do it, just hit Alt or Option plus Z, and then you could undo the mixer uh, changes. So it's not a filter, but you can get back to where you were easily. All right, we see Dallas LaRue checking in from Las Vegas. Um, see, Michael Team says, thanks, Greg. I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. It's probably the train coming. You'd probably hear the train too, so. But all your time in the Air Force, probably being next to the loud planes, maybe the train isn't as loud. Okay, so we see, uh, hey Greg, what is the best way to use multi-tap modular? Uh, I know how to use the delay part very well, but I would like to know what is the best way to use uh, modular's devices on it. So 
let's take a look at it and we'll kind of show you some of this stuff. Um, I think I have a multi-tap delay project. I haven't dived deeply into it in a while. So when I come here, let's see if I have multi-tap delay. Okay, so let's say um, Okay, so just Okay, so when we kind of get more into it, so we could treat it kind of as a very simple delay. You know, so if we want the delay to be more digital modern or more tape, or it'll just kind of tail off. So, you know, we could kind of do all the very typical stuff. Now where it gets really interesting is, you know, when we get into more taps, so let's see if I think I have this might be let's see if I remember this project here. So let's say So now when we want to kind of get into this, so we could think, okay, we're gonna have different effects for the loop section. So we could say, okay, I wanted a delay on a delay. So let me just turn that off. So now we can say, okay, each of the delays, I want it to have a flanger on or an envelope filter. Um, and as we want to do this also, we could say, okay, let's add taps so you know we could come over here and we could just start adding like different numbers of taps so if we wanted these to be eight taps we could have these be set to quarter notes kind of different resolutions of uh, as we work with this if we wanted to just move the particular taps you know you could randomize their placement as well um, and now once we go to like your tap effects each tap we could add a module so say i want a phaser and on this particular mo you know on tap one i wanted the phaser rate to change and on tap four i wanted to have the tone differently so we could take each of the delay taps. So we could say, okay, yeah, we were one delay and then you could modify the different taps here. Um, but each of these taps could have their own effects that are independent. And then we could get into global effects. So we could say, okay, I just wanted to run everything through different reverbs. So if you want really kind of ethereal stuff, like let's say,
So say if we just turn this off, like just a little slide kind of guitar part, and it was great. The, the, my friend who gave me this little track gave it to his slide guitar player. And then he, he's like, wow, it's the coolest thing ever. Who played that part? It's amazing. He's like, oh, it's your part. But just with the multi-tap delay, we could come here and we'll turn this on. So here we could have and see kind of our different effects on each individual tap. If you wanted to have like flander, envelope, and then kind of global effects as well. So you could have a phaser, a reverb, so that now each of the globally or on the taps or just on the actual kind of loop base effect, you could have different effects kind of all at different stages of the delay. So it just could be like the most comprehensive and powerful delay probably ever conceived. Um, but so, and it's just, you know, again, a standard plugin inside of Cubase. So hopefully that helps you. All right, so we see best way to have two vocal takes at the same level, you know, so often when you're doing stuff like that, you know, so there's different approaches. One is kind of an editing approach and one may be more, um, you know, doing processing like compression. So let's say, you know, if we have the, the our vocal file and it's kind of like maybe I want it to bring this level up, you know, one way is to just say, okay, I want this louder or softer and you could adjust kind of clip gain volume. So, you know, one of my friends who does a lot of like really heavy duty vocalists, like, you know, he does Barbra Streisand records and Cubase. Um, and, you know, he's like the king of, you know, just taking little words here and, being able to, you know, take consonants and be able to kind of bring them up or down very easily. So a lot of people will just kind of go through and do that. You know, some people will just very to kind of regulate that. We'll just say, okay, I'm going to put a compressor on so that the loud parts, you know, will be, will come up, you know, will come up in volume and the, or the loud parts will go down in volume and then the soft parts will come up. So it's going to be more consistent, but sometimes that could color the sound. Um, so, you know, different approaches, whether you want it to be editing, some people will choose to do editing here so that you're not pumping compressors so that maybe you could have a compressor to kind of put a little gloss on it. Uh, without having to do a compression stage for correction. So a lot of people will kind of do this. You know, sometimes people will just go through, oh, that, that phrase is just a little too loud, and they will go through and automate different sections of a vocal. But if you have, like, two vocals, you know, you could also just, you know, another approach is, okay, I have this file here, and let's say I have... Um, this file here and you know one of them is softer you know I could just say I want to take both of these files and I'm just going to turn this into a separate file first just for demonstration purposes you know I could take both of these files and go to audio and then if we wanted to do just a process I could say okay let's just gain and I want these, um, you know, to be, or let, let's say I want to do a normalize. And I can say I want these to be at minus, minus three. And now at this point, um, so like as we normalize, I'll just remove this. You know, we, we could just select kind of both events and normalize, and then you could have those, you know, be the same volume for processing. So a number of different approaches that you could do. You know, easiest way, maybe just do compression or just do a little slight bit of editing.
All right. Okay, so we see, uh, so question, could you please show me how to separate a tied track and how to export a split MP3 file? Thank you. Um, so I'm not sure what a tied track is. Um, so, so let's say if I have, uh, I'll take a guess, but let's say, All right, so say we have this going on. So I'm not sure if it's like uh, a tie track is like maybe files that are just kind of mixed maybe together where you have like multiple songs. And then if you wanted to split those, you know, at this point we could um, just say, you know, you could do a, a if you wanted to create new files that were kind of set up, you could do a render in place uh, function, or you could choose to do a file to export uh, selected events, and that can make separate events. Uh, and so, and how to export a split MP3 file. So, you know, I'm not sure if the split MP3 file is like where it's now we do this and we could export three separate MP3 files, but maybe if you could, and this is from SESME Inc., maybe if you could, um, you know, specify a little clearer. Sorry if I'm not understanding. All right, so we see Gerald Ely has discovered the separate edit history for the mixer. So it's a great feature. I think it came in 10 or 10.5. Uh, so we have a question, Greg. Is there a way to lock on a plugin window like frequency analyzer to always be open even when shutting other windows like in Pro Tools? Um, so, but probably if you just come here, um, you know, if we go to like a particular plugin, you could probably right click and say always on top. And now as you go to open up other windows, you know, this remains on top. So maybe if you're referring to maybe uh, if you right click near the top of the file and of, of the window, most windows will always will have an always on top mode. So try that and see if that makes sense and kind of accomplishes what you want. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, what are some uses of the selection tool? It's obviously to, you know, one of the big ones is just to select an object for moving, um, you know, and if you wanted to, you know, so that is like one of the big ones is just like, you know, I, you know, I want to move this event. So the selection tool is great for that. If you hold down like the alt or option key, you know, you could split. So if you wanted to, you know, go to the bottom with the alter option key, you could just split with, you know, that you could come over here if you wanted to do uh, fade ins. So let's say I will take this and I wanted to do uh, a fade in. I wanted to, you know, do a fade while holding down. I think it's alt and can. So let's say if I want to 
Uh, it just the fade while holding down alt, you know, we could slip contents within the particular file with the selection tool. I could also adjust clip gain. I could truncate audio files, the start or the end of the events. If I hold down the alt or option key and go to the lower right hand corner, I could copy. I could also just grab the center edge with the selection tool. So those are some of the things that you could do with the selection tool as well. So See Cubase Shunky saying he didn't know he could randomize the taps in the multi-tap delay. So yeah, that adds a whole other level of uh, goodness to the plugin. I see Jazzy just saying when it was new, he took 10 hours just to play with its features. Yeah. We're coming up with a tutorial video on that. So it was a lot of fun. Okay, so we see, uh, hi Greg, what, what is or are some of the options for duplicating a MIDI part or a section to a new track? Uh, I try copy and paste, but I'm not sure where things will be pasted. Okay, so let me just jump back to a MIDI, some MIDI data here. Okay, so I think like as we paste events, so let's say I move this event here, um, you know, so one of the things that you could do, like just for, you know, duplicating events, so, you know, where it's MIDI or audio, just kind of like what we were showing. So if I wanted to come here and just drag out the center, we can make a copy. Uh, if we don't like that, then uh, I could just hit Control or Command D and that will duplicate the event just like that. Now, if I wanted to move it to another event, like I say, I hold down the alt key and I moved it down, um, but I want it in the same exact time, like maybe I'm just adding a different string library. If I now, so I hold down alt uh, to move it. And if I move it vertically and then I press control, now it's locked where I can't move it in time. So it constrains the direction of the edit. Uh, but if I, so if I moved it like, oh, I was, I'm off, just hold, while holding down the Alt key and pressing it down, tap the Control key and let go. And now it's gonna be in the same exact time. So if I had like a thousand tracks and I accident, I moved it horizontally and now I'm making a copy and I'm on the wrong track, and I hit control, it's going to not only allow me to stay and it's gonna constrain the direction on that particular edit. If we copy, physically copy events, many times when we go to, let's say, a different track and we paste, the paste is gonna be based upon the cursor position. So you could you know, move the cursor to you know, like the front of the event and there's different edit modes where you could do this. So, you know, like if we come to uh, use video follows edit mode, as soon as I select an event here, the cursor goes to the beginning. So if I copy this event and I'm on this particular track and paste, it'll now go to the same spot because the cursor is locked. So as we cut, copy, paste, that would be based upon a cursor position, but a lot of times you may want to just come over here and say, okay, I am just want to copy this uh, and use the constrained direction uh, on either vertical or horizontal, and it's based on the first, uh, the first motion, either vertical or horizontal, which is constrained. So give that a try and let me know. See a lot of see comments from Cubase drunking. Graham Witcher says uh, says the stock plugins in Cubase are great. Why would you 
need to get anything else. Yeah, I saw a whole video and someone says, I'm going to mix the Cubase plugins versus an AMAC, you know, and I thought the Cubase one sounded better or, or so, uh, was difference was so negligible. Even the guy's girlfriend liked the Cubase plugins better. So I thought that was funny. Um, so, but yeah, you get, you know, we, we don't have batteries included plugins. It's a very proactive plugin team that works very hard. Okay, we see Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. See that we're four likes from 100. Great, all right. All right, just report a couple people here. Even though it's just a bot, probably won't make a difference, but. Thank you, Agent K and Jazz Dude, for all of your, you must be popular enough where we have the bots attacking us, so. Okay, so we see a uh, question, where do you change the key in 12 Pro? Um, so it might be, if you go to the setup window, you might see, uh, and click there, you may see the project root key. So that may not be enabled by default. So you could just set it directly there. So give that a try. So go to the settings here. I think that as they added maybe some things for the uh, MIDI remote mapping that, you know, sometimes they will change the default things. So try that. Okay, so I just see uh, from, uh, it says follow up, and maybe this is the MP3 split. Uh, I'm trying to split the vocals and audio, having one play in the left and the other on the right. Um, so, you know, if you want it, so let's say if I do this, you know, um, all right, let me just revert to this. Uh, sorry for, thanks for the clarification on a question. Okay, so um, all right, so if I come here and let's say, you know, there's a number of different ways. So I'm not sure if you want to make like two mono, if you wanted to make a um, one MP3 file that was panned hard left and hard right, where you have the vocals on left and right. So if you want to do that, you know, I mean, you could just pan like the vocals here and go to uh, the other instruments and, you know, pan each of the instruments to the right hand side. And then when you go to export, uh, your audio mix down at that point, you could choose to, you know, have everything uh, that way the vocals will come out just on the left and the instruments on the right hand side for an MP3. So when you do your export audio mix down, 
like a stereo file. So, but I don't know if you need it separated into separate files uh, or if you needed it in one MP3 file where the vocals are just left and everything is panned to the right instrumentally. So if you just pan and then export as a MP3 file uh, directly from here, we'll just do our stereo out. Um, but at that point, you could just, so you could export uh, kind of just like that. All right, so we see Sable Winters joining, wishing everyone a tie-in tool-free Father's Day. So, that's a nice sentiment, Frank. So we see Michael Pierce just saying, constrained direction is something I really need to practice uh, with. I always get it wrong, so. Just move it like in the direction that you want to constrain. Move it that way first, very obviously, and then you know once you get the hang of it, it'll it'll be very fast for you. All right, so we see Ashley Jordan. Ashley Gordon is on the on the live stream. So thanks for joining us today. Welcome to the live stream. All right, so we see question. Hello, Greg. Do you think that Steinberg will implement CLAP standard? So I don't think it's a standard yet. Um, so I think that you know pretty much uh, a lot of aspects of VST three are underutilized, and I didn't really see much that was you know uh, unique. I didn't read through everything, but it didn't seem like there was anything that you know. I think VST three is an incredibly mature standard that's widely used and most widely used plugin format so i'm not sure if there's any benefits of pursuing clap you know but we'll see how it goes so but Okay, see Gareth is saying import that like to everyone. All right, so Gareth is saying, or Michael Team is saying we have 99 likes. So if we haven't hit the like button, you should go for it. All right. Um, so we have uh, from Best Green Jesus is, uh, is there any way to randomize selected track colors to independent colors? Um, so let's see if, I think within the project logical editor, we could set it to a particular color, but I'm not sure if it could be randomized. So it's a set color. So we could set it to a fixed value or increment decrement track colors, but I don't think there's a way to randomize uh, the track colors. Uh, but let's see if we go to the project color setup. Um, So I don't think that there is a a particular randomized for colors. All 
All right, so I think I'm at the end of the question so far. Let's see if anything else kind of sneaks in. All right, we see that we're gonna have some, looks like a project between Gareth and Michael Teens is headed to Sable's way. So hopefully I'll get to play bass on that. Looking forward to that. All right. We'll wait a couple minutes. We know it's Friday in the summer. See if any more questions sneak in. If not, we'll call it a little early. And hopefully everyone will have a wonderful weekend and a happy Father's Day to everyone who's celebrating Father's Day. And we hope that everyone stays safe and healthy. I saw too many friends coming back from Nam that were, were sick. So we'll just wait a couple minutes, see if more questions come in. Wait, see if there's one more question. If not, we'll wrap up a little early. Okay, so with that, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you, everyone, for all the wonderful questions. Uh, we'll be back Tuesday. So, uh, and everyone, please have a wonderful, uh, wonderful weekend. Please stay safe and healthy. And with questions, if you want to send them in advance, you can send them to clubcubase at steinberg.de. And we'll go ahead and wrap up, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye.